Hi everyone, welcome. Um, as you can see, today we have the pleasure of having Miss Susie Snyder and Miss Eva Paddock here to talk to us. Um, I'm going to give you guys a bio, a short little bio on each of them, and then we will let Mrs. Snyder take it away. Okay, Miss Paddock was born in Prague. She was saved by Sir Nicholas Winton when she was three and a half and her sister was nine years old. This was before the Nazis had declared war on Czechoslovakia. Her and her sister were placed on the last kinder transport out of Czechoslovakia and were placed with a foster family in North England. She, she has stayed in touch with them until they passed away. Her parents were able to escape to England and they stayed connected throughout the war. Post-World War II, she grew up in England and moved to Na Massachusetts in 1965. She has worked as a teacher and as a mental health worker since. And Mrs. Snyder is a curator at the, at the United States Holocaust Museum. She was one of the most educated people in the field of the kinder transport and the Holocaust and has access to hundreds of archives, which she will be sharing with us today. So Mrs. Snyder, if you'd like to take it away. Sure, so um, I'm not actually the, um, the most um, educated because as a curator, we take in a lot of material um, and we cross all borders and divisions and um, I, I've done work on hidden children and on the voyage of the St. Louis and on the displaced persons era um, the and I did a small um, little exhibition and worked with um, the kinder transport survivors and I worked with a woman who was making a documentary um, named Into the Arms of Strangers, which is a great documentary, but doesn't, it, it talks a lot about both the, um, the Western European, the Germans and Austrians that went to the United Kingdom, as well as the Czech children that went to the United Kingdom. And clearly the numbers of German and Austrian children were greater than the Czech children, but nevertheless, there was rescue on both sides. Um, of both parts of the country and so are both parts of Europe and so I wanted to give you a little bit of a um, I wanted to share some media with you because I think media is much more helpful than just listening to me talk so um, the I'm going to share my screen and hopefully um, I hope you don't if you have any problems hearing me let me know um, Josh, you should uh, make Susie a co-host, so then she can uh, share her screen. Right. Thank you. How do you? You click on the participants, and then. Okay. Um. Oh, I see it. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to show. Um, a PowerPoint, it's just very slight. I'm only going to, I dumped everything in a PowerPoint just so that you could see it better. Um, so let me just, I have to just go down to um, slideshow. So let me get it going. Okay. So um, can everyone see? Yes. Okay. So I just wanted to show a few pictures from Eva's collection of material that we were able to scan before I went into, we went into hibernation for COVID-19. I was, I had, was in the process of scanning the second part of her collection. Um, but this is, um, and I would like Eva to talk, Eva, can you talk about what we're looking at? Sure. So um, when Nicholas Winton um, um, was in Prague and making lists of children um, who needed to be saved, children of high risk, and I, my sister and I were two of them. They, the, the, the family, the parent, whoever was bringing the child, the, the children there to get Nikki to put them on, the, on his list, uh, had to bring a photograph. And this is a photograph of myself, the little one, and my sister that my mother brought to Nicholas Winton and that went into um, the pages that he sent to England to ask people if they would take refugees. And um, he, he had to find homes for all of us, and he did. And if he found a home, then you were on the list and were allowed to travel. And that was my label. We had, each child had a label. My number was 639. And I 
was really cute in those days. And um, the, um, one of the papers captured me looking very happy at that moment. Now you see the, the clipping. And can you, can everyone see the caption at the bottom? Okay. The family that took us in were called the Radcliffs. And here we are with the Radcliffs. They became known to us as Mummy and Daddy Radcliffe. You see the, the, the people, the, the, the adults there. And next to um, my sister in the middle is their daughter, Mary. And she, this, this is a very small house. Um, we're standing right outside the, the window and that's about the width of the house. It's one room wide and it was called a two up, two down, two rooms on the ground floor, two rooms upstairs. And so they said they would take both of us. They were only going to take one refugee, but then they saw that picture and said they couldn't, they couldn't split us up. So they, they took two of us. And so they would have room for us. Mary, who was about 16, went to live with grandma around the corner. That's how generous and wonderful that family was. And I'm just going to jump in here and say that um, one of the questions that Josh asked, Josh asked me to respond to is how did different refugees who were coming from Europe to the United Kingdom, how were they treated? Well, first of all, um, they were not often housed together. S quite often siblings were separated, separated in different experiences, different homes, and different environments. Um, so I think this is really an extraordinary example of two people who really, this family made an effort that was pretty extraordinary, wouldn't you say, Eva? Absolutely. They now, had how no, did idea, you... no idea if they would keep us for a year, two years, three years, whatever, that they just took us in and were going to look after us for whenever long they needed to. And um, Eva, how was your, um, what was a day, your day-to-day -day like with them, living with them? Um, they, they, they were the most loving, wonderful people. They were, they were um, ardent Methodists, uh, what was called teetotal. They didn't drink and alcohol, at least Daddy Ratcliffe, I think sometimes went off a little bit, but that was, that was their culture. That was their value. They took us, they took us in. It was a small town in the North of England. Um, and we, we, they became known to us as Mummy and Daddy Ratcliffe. Um, they were, we were very fortunate. They were very loving. The whole street took us in. This was a very small town in the north of England that had never, actually, I think, never seen anybody who didn't speak English for a start. It was, you know, this wasn't, a, this wasn't near London or anywhere cosmopolitan at all. And so we were taken in really to the heart of all of the street and the locals and the, um, and the town council eventually gave, when you will hear that my parents escaped and we, they, they found us public housing near, near to where the Ratcliffe's lived. We were so very, very fortunate. Let me just back up a second because you said that you were not living in London, you were living outside of London in um, a small community. So it wasn't this the, actually, once the Germans started bombing England, that was really the best place to be, correct? Right. Um, and while you were living with them, first of all, do you, did you have memory of your, did you have, what was, let me back up again. What was the time period that between the time that you arrived to live with them and the time that you next saw your parents? Um, my father had escaped earlier and I, he was ill and living in London. I do not remember when I next saw him. Um, my mother uh, um, escaped in 1940 after war had been declared. So I did, we didn't see her until the spring of 1940 when she came via Norway. Okay, so not a lot of time had gone by. Again, how unusual is it that your parents were able to get out? Yes, it was about nine months before, uh, to, before I saw my mother again. And at three and a half, that's a very long time. It is a long time. Did you remember her? fairly well we get to that business of what's real memory and what you're told yes um and people can read about that um so um i'm told that when she arrived when she arrived i quote did not speak czech anymore which 
if you know anything about language development was was not possible because I had spoken Czech right up to the age of of three but um, I think I was so angry and upset that she had disappeared that for the moment I was not going to have anything to do with her of course once we began to live together that all went away but I'm told that when she arrived I, I could not speak Czech and didn't didn't wasn't able to communicate with her which must have been extraordinarily upsetting for her. How was the relationship with your sister? Did your sister keep you comfortable? Did she comfort you during the time period that your mother and father were gone? Um, were away from them? I, I think just because we were together, you know, it, we were living, living together. I, I think at three and a half, one is very resilient. Once we had gotten somewhere loving and calm and predictable, you just very quickly settle in. And that's what happened. How was the relationship with your foster family after your mother had come to retrieve you? Oh, wonderful. They lived near, near to where, where we, 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 the house that was found for us was near to the Ratcliffs. Mm -hmm. And they continued to be tremendous supports and, and great friends, well, for the rest of their lives. But during the war years, when we lived nearby, um, they would come for a meal every um, every Friday or Saturday evening and played a game called Lexicon, sort of like Scrabble. They helped my mother learn English. They um, made sure we had enough food. They did all of the things to, to help us be comfortable in the environment. Oh, they, they were very close friends. They came to my wedding. They saw, they met my first child and so forth. It was a, it was a lifelong, lifelong um, friendship. Um, very close. That's amazing. Um, Josh, do you have any questions? Did you want to ask or did you, would you like um, Eva to cover anything that she hasn't that I might have missed? It's obviously not enough time, but. Uh, I think I'll um, just continue with um, uh, what we're planning on doing. And then um, right before we'll transition into uh, general Q&A, we'll just have a couple of um, um, the hosts ask questions. Okay. Um, I just wanted to cover a little bit about Nicholas Winton and um, another, ex I wanted to talk about somebody else who is quite instrumental in helping German and Austrian Jewish children leave. But before I do that, um, Eva, um, what, tell me a little bit about your relationship with Nicholas Winton. Did you know him as an adult? Did you meet him as an adult? I did, but perhaps you can get to that after you've talked about him and I'll make sure. a connection about when when people knew he even existed. Okay, um, so I'm just gonna show a film clip now. I, again, I'm going to, um, um, I'm sorry to do this to jump around, but I have some media and I think the media is very helpful. Um, Susie, is there, that has music as well? No, it's silent. Okay. The media that I have is silent. Um, so this is a picture. This is um, a picture. This is a film, small film clip. It's only a few minutes. And it's a film clip of children boarding a plane, a Royal Dutch airline, the KLM airline in Prague, going to, uh, leaving, leaving Prague um, in 1939. And there is, the clip is, self-explanatory. It's a little propagandistic. Um, however, I think it's a really good clip to show because it shows children boarding, saying goodbye to their parents. And then there's, there is a part in the clip, which I will point out where Nicholas Winton, there's a nice shot of Nicholas Winton holding a toddler um, towards the end. So let me show you the clip. I can add like one more, or one little thing. You can talk um, over it's silent. So, um, Nicholas, most of the kinder transports went from, um, or that Nicholas Winton coordinated, went from Czechoslovakia to um, England. However, there were a couple of, um, I want to say there was a flight in like January 1939, where he was able to um, save a couple of children, um, not as many as on the other kinder transports. And they like um, took a plane to um, Sweden, where they were also um, able to find refuge. Yes. And um, this is important because when you were coming from Germany and Austria, they were taking trains from Germany, generally, and the trains would stop at the um, 
Dutch border. And the children often talk about how they were greeted by the Dutch with hot chocolate and sweets and treats. And it was as if the entire, the, they could feel the lifting because the Dutch were so much more friendly than the Germans. And, um, and I don't know if they, if this was something that they realized later in life or if they realized it at the time, but they were, they, you know, were quite welcoming to these children as they were traveling to the United Kingdom because they would go to the Netherlands and then they would take a boat. They had to take a boat. I mean, so this is, we're looking at um, film footage of, of um, generally of people. Here, this is at the airport. This is not Nicholas Winton, I should add. Right. But that's the same child that was getting on the plane. Yeah. The iconic shot of Winton. Right, there will be, definitely. But it's clear that they're asking these children to smile and... So this is, this is about January of 39, and um, Nicholas Winton came to Czechoslovakia in um, December of 38, where he um, started, uh, or where he began his operations, but he left about a month later. So much of his work in coordinating the kinder transports was from his home office in 1939. He was a broker by day and a righteous gentile by night. Right. He was a stockbroker in the United Kingdom in London, and he had a friend um, named um, Martin Blake. That's him. That's Nicholas. So he had a friend named Martin Blake who said, you know, what are you doing for over Christmas <laughs> or over the holiday? And, um, and Nicholas said, um, I don't, I don't know, but basically Martin Blake dragged him in and uh, um, alerted him to the refugees plight in the Czech Republic. And even Nicholas, Nicholas Winton went on to do this work and he was very humble about it, but even his mother at some point was involved in doing the paperwork and the required, there was so much involved. You had to get paperwork for each child. There had to be passports. There had to be permissions. Um, it was, there were hundreds of children that he was able to get out in this manner. 669 to be precise. Thank you. <laughs> and, and you notice that on these clips, adults were going, by the time Nicholas Winton and Martin Blake and Trevor Chadwick were working together to, to get the trains out, only children were allowed on the train, no adults. And it's interesting to also note that um, later in life that Nicholas Winton really f I seriously felt that it was not an extraordinary act that he was doing and it was brought to his attention that it was heroic and extraordinary. Do you want to talk about that, Eva? Well, um, he just went about his life. He joined the army, he joined the air force. You know, he, he was very young at this time. He was in his twenties. Mm -hmm. So as he said, once war, he, he went, did his work. Then he went to England with all these lists and started trying to find homes and money to bring the children out and working with the government. Um, but then, as he said, once war broke out in September, there was nothing more he could do. So he did, the Germans marched into Prague in March um, 30, March 15th, 1939. So up to that time, he was working to arrange these, the trains and things. But once war broke out in September, he, he could no longer do that. So he went about his normal young adult life. He joined the Air Force. And later on, you know, went back to the banking and got married, had children. And that was just something, it was like, it, it was like joining the Peace Corps. You know, lots of people join the Peace Corps. They do wonderful things. And then later in life, they kind of put that on the back burner. And nobody thinks it's, most people don't think of that as a heroic time, which in many, many cases, even now it was. And so later his wife um, was cleaning up and found a box of papers and stuff and Nikki said, oh, that's just something I did, you know, before the, before I even met her, of course, and it was about to dump it. And she said, no, 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 that these are important things about children. This is children's lives. And she was the one that got people interested. And eventually, um, 
um, a, a, um, a TV celebrity who did a program called That's Life, um, took up and took an interest in this, had invited secretly, she, she found the names. Do you have that, a picture of that? The, are you gonna show that? Let me see if I can find the clip. Keep talking and I'll see if I can find the clip. So eventually Nicholas Winton had these lists with the names of the children, where they went, it's, it's a mystery to me. We, we don't do nearly as well with our computers. Right now, this country doesn't know where half the refugee children are. Nikki Winton, hands and ink and pen, had a list of where every child went, the address to which they went to, the names, the, the addresses. And um, so the, the woman, um, the television person, had, been, had found this list in the papers and these boxes I mentioned and contract, contacted as many as she could, including my sister, who was one of them, and invited them to the studio on the, on the evening that she was doing this program. Um, and that um, changed everybody's life because they didn't know who he was either. So on that night, she said, well, I have these lists and this is what this person did. She's saying to the audience and Nick is sitting in the front row. And then she said, well, is there anybody in this audience um, who owes their lives to Nicholas Winton? And the whole audience stood up. And that's the first time any of us knew who he was. And it's the first time he met all of these people that he, he had never kept in touch with anybody. We were just names and numbers. So let's, we, I pulled the clip up. So can you see it? Okay, yeah. let's watch it. And this has audio. So let me know if you can't hear it. I think the TV show host like talks about the scrapbook for a bit. Some stories which were not only an audience to, but may become their participants. Oh, this, this is a little bit mythical. I didn't quite think this is. This scrapbook surfaced after gathering dust for decades. Once it did go, it said about a whole chain of incredible events. That's me before I left for England. But until 1988, I had no idea who had rescued me from all but certain death. It was this old man that saved my life and that of hundreds of others in the Second World War. Years we knew nothing about him. Four children. This is his scrapbook. There are all kinds of fascinating pictures in it. Perhaps you can see this is a picture of Nicholas Winton himself with one of the children he rescued. If you look at the very back of this scrapbook, fascinating things in it, all the letters. But back here is the list of all the children. This is Vera Diamond, now Vera Gissing. We did find her name on his list. Vera Gissing is with us here tonight. Hello, Vera. And uh, I should tell you that you are actually sitting next to Nicholas Winton. Now, the person on the other side of Nikki is my sister, if that comes up on this clip. I didn't know that, Eva. <laughs> they were at school together, but um, sitting there and... Vera. And Vera wrote a book um, called Pearls of Her Childhood, I think, which is like a memoir of yeah. um, growing yeah, up after the kinder That's my sister. And this is the actual pass that we were given to come to England. And as another of the children that you saved. So it was after this that we began to know. Thank you. Can I ask, is there anyone in our audience tonight who owes their life to Nicholas Winton? If so, could you stand up, please? Thank you. 
Um, he, was very, there? he was very upset about that because he had no idea. And it was total shock to him. He was upset because he was surprised. At the right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's, um, I will say that's very interesting that he was, um, because not surprising though, because he is an extreme, he was an extremely humble person. And I met with his daughter and his daughter and I did a program a few years ago. And she said that it was really, he didn't talk about it as if he was heroic. And one of the questions that um, Josh asked me was, can you talk about why countries chose to help? And the question that I said to him should not be, why is it that countries chose to help? The question should be, why didn't more countries help, including our own? Um, so uh, one of the very well-known facts of the Kinder Transport is that it managed to rescue 10,000 people in less than a one-year period because, as Eva mentioned, the war broke out and it stopped people from being able to leave uh, Germany and go to the United Kingdom. It really prevented people from the war prevented people from moving into the United Kingdom at that point. Um, and um, in February of 1939 in Congress, Robert um, Wagner, a Democrat from New York, and Edith Rogers, a Republican from Massachusetts, co-sponsored a bill to try to um, allow 20,000 children into the United States under the age of 14. And it was blocked in Congress. It, it failed and it was blocked mainly by um, a, a congressperson named Robert Rice Reynolds, who was a Democrat from North Carolina who was vehemently anti-Semitic and racist. Um, and again, the question is, why didn't more countries help? Why didn't more countries open their borders, at least to the children? Um, and we can't answer that question. Um, but so in talking about the kinder transport, um, I didn't want to move away from Nicholas Winton, but I also wanted to talk about um, somebody else who was Jewish and was rescuing children, trying to take children from Berlin to the United Kingdom, and that's Norbert Wolheim. And he was um, in his 20s, he was married, he had a child, he was living in Berlin, and he was asked to ha assist with helping direct children from Berlin to the United Kingdom, and sometimes he would join them on their voyage and then be required to come back right away. So he himself was a German who was trying to get his own family out of Nazi occupied Germany. So I wanted to share a little bit like five minutes of his clip if you don't mind. Is everyone okay with that? Okay. Let me know if you can't hear. Very low. Now, to, to select these people was a very uh, 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 difficult thing. And Better? Had the responsibility. Slightly. Was certainly everybody uh, uh, who had a chance to go to England certainly looked for a chance. And there were friends or relatives pressing on them and said, Are you stupid to go back? But this was the condition. And they had, the, the Nazis had told us in no uncertain term that. If people would not uh, uh, obey uh, their order, then uh, uh, these, these transfers would come to an end, and this certainly we could not afford. So, uh, as I say, I, I was very, very careful in the selection of those people, and thank God, with the exception of one case, it worked. Now, we had uh, uh, um, 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 approximately, I think, 20, uh, 20 transports uh, uh, which left Berlin. Uh, it was my duty to see all of them off, and I was uh, 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 every morning when they came together, I was there to, to arrange it. So um, um, whether I went with the transports or not, that was in a, in a big hall in, in, in uh, called the Schlesische Bahnhof in Berlin, and also Part of my duty was to see to it that the children came to Berlin in time, so that they were, pre and certainly they came with their parents or their relatives, 
and this was then the uh, the, the the moment of their goodbye. So uh, there was a problem uh, with the first transport, which for which I had not been responsible. Uh, a smaller group had left in, in in December, I think, and the parents had accompanied these children to the to the to the trains. And certainly, the parents in good faith they tried to get the best window seats for for their children. And there was a certain turmoil. And the police told us in no uncertain terms that this would be repeated. They would control. And the police, meaning the Nazis. All these arrangements. We were able to convince them that we will take over, that we will see to it that order should prevail, and that they shouldn't interfere, that they could be present if they want to, and thought that they were present fine, but they shouldn't interfere. And I think it worked. So uh, then in the morning, when when uh, when such a transport was due to uh, to leave, as I say, I was there, and uh, it was a very 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 I remember that very distinctly. The atmosphere, you know, it was there was tension in the air. There was a, an atmosphere of expectation. Uh, there was concern by the parents. There were there were tears. There were uh, 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 tears of laughter and tears of, of joy. And, 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 and concern and pain. And it, it was a very, very special atmosphere, which was difficult to describe. And then when the, when the hour of departure came closer, I uh, ascended a, a chair as some kind of a lectern and told the parents, and said, ladies and gentlemen, that the time has arrived to say goodbye. Because we are in a strict order not to let you accompany uh, your children to the platform. The escorts will take over. And the baggage handlers had to do their work before to, to handle the baggage. But you cannot uh, come and don't please uh, cooperate and don't make our, our work more difficult. Uh, but this is the time you have to say goodbye. And there were, you know, last kisses and last hugs and, 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 and but in general, I, I still admire these people, how courageous they were. Nobody broke down, but also there was the expectation that uh, sooner or later they would be reunited again. Very often I ask myself the question later, where did I to take the courage to do that? The call it Hutzpah. Where from? I was young, I was only 25 in these days, and I thought uh, uh, that this is a job to be done in order to help these children. And I also, I must say that at this time, I and nobody else could have thought for a moment that this would be for many, for almost 90%, the last goodbye. Nobody could expect that, that let us say, a year and a half later, after these transport had rolled to the west into freedom, the transport would leave for the east into the into the slaughterhouses of Hitler in Auschwitz or Madani or Treblinka. I said nobody could foresee it in the worst of of of, of your vision. And then uh, 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 thus I I, I say uh, this probably also uh, uh, yes. Uh, it gave me the justification to say to these parents, uh, and many I uh, talked to, 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 to the children who were safe, I just said that this is a moment, they, one of the most important moments in their lives, which they still remember vividly. And I was involved in that. But I came to terms with it by saying this is the contribution which, which, which we had to make, and in the long run, at least for these children, it, it turned out for the good. Um, so, I just wanted to point out, um, Norbert Walheim was, his wife was, he had a baby, and his wife was pregnant, and in 1943, they were deported from Berlin to Auschwitz. They all perished, and he survived, and he, after the war, he was a very instrumental part in trying to rebuild life. He was liberated. He settled in the Bergen-Belsen Displaced Persons Camp in Germany near Hanover, and he rebuilt his own life. And um, he had no choice because 
had he gone to the United Kingdom and not returned, the process of moving these children would have come to an end. So um, I just wanted to point out his story because I think it's hard to imagine that you were part of this process of helping to save children but couldn't save your own. Children had to be three years of age to be able to be on the kinder transport. Um, Josh, do you want to, how would you like to, do you want to take time for questions or do you want me to continue or? Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to unmute yourselves, um, be it for um, Susie or for Eva or for both. You don't have a little thing at the bottom that puts a hand up if you want to speak, so I'm putting a hand up. <laughs> um, you it's Just to go back to Susie's question, did we meet, so Nicholas went in, so yes, in the in the following years, we got to know him, Jim and I went to visit him, Millen, my sister became very good friends of his, I'm a friend of Barbara Winton, I know very well, um, he loved birthday parties, so there are lots of pictures of us at his birthday parties, including one at his 100th birthday, where we made him a big um, train cake and, and there was a big party at Liverpool Street Station. So in his later years, um, he, he became well recognized and he was, became known to all of us as, as we became Nicky's family. There's a very nice film called Nicky's Family you can get on Netflix, but he became everybody's grandparent, basically surrogate. So lots of us visit, visited him. Um, and there were lots of years to do that because he didn't die till he was 106. Um, I have a question. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a, a little bit about what the atmosphere was like in 1938 in the early um, years of the kinder transports. I mean, it seems so crazy that they started taking these really drastic measures to get kids out of Europe, um, even when they you didn't know that so many horrible things were about to happen. Well, I think it's, um, you're quite right. You bring that up. Um, obviously, Norbert Walheim also brought that up. One of the things that we see again and again when we're looking at letters and documents is that the refugees that did leave often will say, my, my mother didn't want to leave. My father didn't want to leave. We had extended family. We had a good life. We didn't want to leave it. Um, because who could have imagined that people were going to be sent to the death camps? But after Kristallnacht in 1938, I think it became apparent to many, many hundreds and hundreds and thousands of people that they needed to get out. And the circumstances quickly changed following November 1938. It changed so drastically that there were lines at the um, consulates in major cities all over Germany and in, in um, Vienna uh, the very next day. And I think part of it was that because you have so many people who are arrested under the circumstances and the conditions on Kristallnacht that they, they can be released if they leave the country. But you know, leaving the country was complicated. You had to have somebody to go to in the United States. You had to have an affidavit of support. Your affiant had to be a person who was financially solvent. They couldn't only agree to support you, but they had to prove with their tax records in the United States that they were solvent. Um, it was complicated. It was very difficult. The Nazis made it difficult to um, get out. You had to have, um, you had to prove that you didn't have any criminal background. You had to prove that you didn't owe any money. You had to walk away with no, no money. You had to leave everything behind. And I think many people who had businesses and thriving lives in Germany, Austria, the Czech Republic, they realized that they had to walk away from everything. And when many people realized that they did need to leave, it was too late. It was well after that, 1940, 41, you really couldn't get out after 42. I would have thought you couldn't get out once, once war began, actually. 
Um, you could get out. So many people were coming over in um, 1940. They did not come to the United States, but they would leave only through Portugal. And um, they would go down to Italy and try to get into Palestine. Um, you had people who were still able as early as 1940 to go to by ship to South American countries. But you couldn't, after, after basically early 42, you could not anymore leave from, um, from Portugal, which is where most people that late left from. I think, I think the circumstances, to answer the, the young lady's question about leaving, the circumstances for leaving Germany and Austria were different from the situation in Czechoslovakia. They, mm -hmm. they, they, the, the refugees began to accumulate outside of Prague, where the people who lived in the Sudetenlands, the ones that were adjacent to, to Germany, and they could see the anti-Semitism there, and they, they, were, they looked to escape to Czechoslovakia because they didn't think anything bad was happening there. Um, and so the, the issue in Czechoslovakia, and the reason people left, was when Hitler decided he was going to take over the country. Up, up to that time, the, the, the anti-Semitism and Kristallnacht had those dramatic effects in Germany and Austria, but had not affected Czechoslovakia. Correct. Yeah. Or in Hungary. I mean, in Hungary, right. there was no occupation in, in, until 1944. Right. And was, when it happened, it happened quickly. And the Hungarians, the Hungarian Jews were, uh, they were, they had no recourse. They had nowhere to go. Yeah. So they, the, 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 the clarity of leaving Czechoslovakia, if you were in, if you were Jewish and in danger, was when the Germans marched in, basically. Um, and then, then you knew it was going to be the same as Germany. So, yeah. I also want to point out really quickly that a lot of Germans and Austrians did see the writing on the wall and went to countries like France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, especially to the, to the, uh, to the Netherlands and Belgium, thinking that they were better off and safer there. But then the Nazis overtook those countries in 1940. I have a question. Hi, my name is Nitsan. Hi, Nitsan. Uh, <laughs> I am the BBY Oshlicha, I was born and raised in Israel. Um, and two years ago, I studied abroad in the Czech Republic, mm -hmm. in uh, Brno. Lubitichewski? <laughs> Mas um, mamash nothing. I know to say, jedno uh, pivo prosim. Oh, my children all know jedno pivo prosim. That means one beer, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first sentence. Oh, jak se mash? Yak I know. How are you? I know. Uh, I interrupted you. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> years. No, and I was wondering. Uh, I don't know if I missed it, but how was it for you to come back after um, after the war, or like when was your first visit to the Czech Republic? You mean? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so there, I'm going to answer in two parts. From, I'll answer for myself and explain. Um, my father was a journalist. He was very well known. That was why we had to leave Czechoslovakia. That's a whole other, other story. He was offered a job in 1945 by the Czech government in, in an organization called UNRWA, the United Nations Relief um, Association. But he was very politically astute, and he realized that because the Russians had liberated Czechos what was then Czechoslovakia, it was going to become a communist country. And he decided, in his words, I, I don't want to have to run twice. He, he, was not, he was not going to be willing to live under a communist regime. And so we decided, he decided I was, that the family would not return to Czechoslovakia. On the other hand, my uncle who had been in the, in the uh, Czech squadron of the British Air Force and had been a communist before the war when many young idealistic um, people were, because it was a, you know, it was a, it was a very um, um, interesting and, and idealistic um, idea, um, didn't, didn't have the, 
terrible overtones it grew to have, he did go back and he suffered terribly under the, under the communists. Um, so that my story is that I went back with, um, in the 1960s when our, my child, my youngest child was three and I went back with my mother. That was the first time we lived in the States. We'd moved then, she lived in England, but we went back and we went to see with the house where we lived and we went to the village. And since then I've been back many, many times and my children have all been, we've maintained and grown a very strong relationship with, with Czechoslovakia and with old relatives. So I had a couple of cousins left, others were killed. Um, but many people had went back looking for relatives and family um, from England, especially the older kind of transport children, the, you know, the ones who had been like 15, 16, and generally did not find any relatives. Some stayed and then some just emigrated to Israel, many places. Yeah. Um, but for me going back, was was very was very interesting and and very moving for, to be there with my mother and my my Czech identity has strengthened as I've grown older because you really you really are who your roots are and uh, though you can emigrate and live far away it's the same with my Judaism that's who you are and and eventually you you bring them back into your life. I had about myths when I was 65. Mazel tov. <laughs> Any questions? Come on, you guys must have questions. There's 25 of you. We've stunned them. Throw anything out there. Um, okay, and if not, tell us, why you're, tell us why you're here and why you're interested. Come on, Josh, you know how to do this. Oh, <laughs> um, I was actually going to ask, why do you two think it's important to learn about the Holocaust today? Eva, do you want to go first? Okay. Well, I do think, you know, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. has a very um, strong educational um, bent on that it's important to remember, not only to remember, but to act after you learn about the Holocaust. Now, you're, I mean, this group of, of young adults, you are not our typical group that comes through the museum. Our visitation is 90% not Jewish, 40% school children. But we get school children from all over the United States now. And, um, and I think it's important for Jews and non-Jews alike to know that they, um, that they can act and there are, it, since I have been at the museum, I joined the museum in 1991. And when I joined the museum, there have been, right after I joined the museum, after the museum opened, the Rwandan genocide happened. And since I've been at the museum, we've had, you've seen a number of crises in the Congo, in Darfur, the Rohingya, I mean, there's 800,000 Syrian refugees sitting on the border right now because of um, ethnic cleansing um, of Syria. And there, this is problematic. We can't sit idly by. You obviously know that it's impossible to act when you see something going on. It's very difficult to know how to respond when something's going on in another, another country. But even next to you, your classmates, your friends, people who you see getting bullied. I mean, it's, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. My children, I live in Northern Virginia. We don't live in a Jewish area. My children come home, not weekly, but my children come home monthly and they tell me stories about anti-Semitism that occurs at their school or things that they hear. Uh, it's completely unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. And in this climate, it's just, it's, it's horrifying and I really don't understand how people can stand by and not do anything. And I think that's the most important thing. When you hear survivors talk, you, it makes you want to act. Um, it, it really does. And I feel the generation of survivors that we have are great educators. We're very lucky to have them. You all need to reach out, speak to them, 
I mean, Nitsan, I'm uh, assuming that I'm not sure if um, I'm, is Nitsan your last name or first name? My first name. Okay, so Nitsan, you live in Israel, right? I actually live in D.C. You live in D.C., okay. <laughs> but I, I am, I'm from Israel. I'll be back in Israel. So you understand that it's a little bit different because you live amongst a huge com community of survivors and the respect that we give them is important, but we need to listen to them as well. They're great educators. Um, Eva, would you, can you add to any of that? You must. You often ask me what I, what, you know, what I would want people to take. And it's, it's, as you say, my, my, my message is looking at, I often talk, I mostly talk about Nicholas Winton, though I'm shifting to, to have it be more about altruism because there were more people who helped my survival, my, my father to escape and so forth. Um, but um, my message is that one person can make a difference and can make a difference in a huge number of lives or even in just one. And it's the same as yours, that it's really important to act every individual to, to act. You don't need a committee. You see something that needs to be done, um, st start it. You don't need permission to be, to be doing good works. And I don't mean knitting scarves, which can also be good works. I mean, really entering into situations like bullying or racism and so on and standing up um, strongly for what you know is right. And you have to do it individually. And this country is in poor shape right now. It's, uh, you know, things that happened in the 30s, um, people didn't think they could happen. People need to watch this country very carefully because some of the same elements um, of bullying in its largest sense are all over the place. So I really admire all of you who've shown up today and encourage you too. to go out there and lead. Um, and before you all leave, I just want to tell you that if you are living in D.C. or are coming to D.C., you know, you're welcome to connect with me at the museum. And if you want a little behind the scenes and, you know, I'm happy to do it. We get in a lot of collections all the time, even knows because I wasn't the first curator who accepted her first collection, but then she has since donated more she donated this amazing trunk that her family dragged around the world. And it's, we're very fortunate to have these amazing artifacts and I'm happy to share them with anyone who comes. And um, so I have to make a quick plug for when you get released from hibernation, I'm anxiously waiting for my, for my new dossier of- Yes, I know. <laughs> I actually um, scanned it before um, we were shut down and then I didn't have a chance to print it. And, but um, Eva's, you can see much of what we have cataloged. We have a lot cataloged on our website. And Eva's story, she, her, her, some of her collections are on our website. So check it out. Um, they're cataloged. There are no images attached to it yet, but that's to come. And if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. And you can um, reach out to me via Josh. Yeah, I'll drop... Um, Susie's and Eva's emails in the chat right now if you guys want to um, reach out to them with any further questions but um, just once again thank you so so much for um, coming to join us today um, it's really important that we tell the stories of the holocaust as um, what Eva said um, we're living in times where um, we're seeing some of these elements again, and even though we can't say it's the Holocaust, we wanna make sure that we're taking a stand and not sitting idly by. Um, for the rest of Yom HaShoah, BBYO is hosting um, a series of programs, Zikaro and Bus Alone, where there are intimate Zoom calls with Holocaust survivors. Um, likely there may be some in your region. However, there are also international ones that are being led. And um, the Genocide Education Committee is also hosting a couple more uh, programs about the Holocaust um, and different elements of the Holocaust um, today and tomorrow. Um, right after this, Rachel is having a program. So if you guys want to hop on BBYO On Demand, that would be great. Um, and you don't have to be a member of BBYO to join. And yeah, once again, thank you so, so much, Susie and Eva, for joining us. And we really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you so much, Josh, for organizing. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank Lovely you. to meet you, Eva. Yeah. Josh, hi, hi to you folks. Thank you. And to Ellie. 
<laughs> Thank you. Be safe, everyone. You yeah. too. Thank you. Everybody. Good to meet you, Susie. You too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Miss Snyder. Yes. Where do you live in Northern Virginia? I live in Vienna. Oh, I live, in, okay, we live in Spotsylvania. You do? Yeah. Ah, well, it's very nice to meet you. You live close enough to come visit me at the museum. Yes, we'd love to. Yes, please do. Thank you. Be well. Thank you, Josh. Of course. Thank um, you. Thanks. If you guys want to ask um, any one-on-one -on -one questions, or unless you guys are, you and Eva are busy right now. I don't. I can, I'm happy to hang out for a little while. Yeah. Awesome. Um, if anybody else wants to ask a one-on-one -on -one question, I'll keep the Zoom open for a little bit longer. But other than that, um, yeah. Oh, your mother was there. Irene was up there. Where is she gone? <laughs> She's here. Um, Hannah? Um, yeah, my question from you, Eva. Um, and I guess you kind of touched on this. I just wanted to hear a little bit more about it. What do you remember? Like, what was it like when you were originally introduced to the Radcliffe's? Like, do you remember like kind of what sort of thing was going through your mind that you're like with a totally new family now and like you didn't know for how long? Okay. Um, I was three and a half, so I yeah. really, I really don't have memories of specific things like that. At that age, if you're welcomed with um, love and you know probably something good to eat and a, and a toy, um, you that's you live in the moment and and i have i'm so lucky i have only really wonderful memories of them and my mother who was very she was a physician and she was smart she was very sensitive to the fact that i had really bonded with mummy ratcliffe so she didn't make any attempt to rip me away or anything we we continue to see them a lot um and um you know, she, she she understood that that person was very important in my life and very, very grateful to her. I have to say one of the things we haven't touched on is the extraordinarily bravery of fam parents like my mother, like I'm with, who, who took young children, put them on the train to save their lives, not knowing whether they would ever see them again. That's really the ultimate self-sacrifice. Yes, I have, I have a volunteer who was also, she wasn't even three, but she somehow managed to sneak on to the kinder transport with three older sisters. And um, she never saw her parents again. That's the most of the story, yeah. Right. I, her oldest sister stayed connected with her through the entire time that they were in the United Kingdom so that she would have a relationship with her, but it, they were all four girls staying in four different places. We, we, we were stayed together. And my sister lives in England now, but we see each other all, all the time. More, more on Zoom now than physically, but sure. <laughs> a lot of travel, yeah. Have you ever talked to your mother um, about what that experience was like for her? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And that's very unusual too. Many survivors don't have that opportunity and or don't have... Um, the strength or the relationship psychologically to discuss those times. And, and that's a, a big problem for many people. As sure. it happened, I, I started dealing with what was obviously early childhood trauma. I mean, in later life, the effects of that travel come home, as they say, to roost. But I was very, again, fortunate. I was interested in psychology, a therapist. I had an opportunity to, to, to meet my mother came to visit and for us to talk openly and for me to be able to say to her um but you, you have to understand the context to say um i i felt as though you threw me away i mean because that's that's that is in fact what a three-year-old would feel like and she was able to say yes i i totally understand that and you know i mean i, I knew intellectually it was to save my life but I was, be able to, I was able to share those very important inner feelings. And then I asked her how it felt for her to have done that. And she said she felt as though she was dying. Wow. Because it's sort of like rebirth, you know? She, she knew that she might not see us again, but she was giving us an opportunity. So we were very fortunate. We had a very wonderful relationship in her old age. Many people 
A, don't recognize how traumatic those events were. Other adult survivors used to say, oh, the children who survived, they, they didn't go through anything. They were just kids. Right. They didn't know what was going on. It was nothing. Well, turns out it's a big deal. Oh, it was totally something. <laughs> Having done an exhibition on hidden children, absolutely those children suffered more than adults because they often survived never ever meeting their parents again. What I mean, just to have your parents abandon you in that's right. whatever way uh, the, the child's the child's interpretation is one of abandonment. At three, you don't think, oh, she's sending me away, so she saved my life. You have no concept of that. All you have is a concept of being rejected or abandoned. That's, that's right. And as a child, you are your life is being entrusted to some somebody, your parents have entrusted your life to somebody that they don't know what it's going to be like. So for example, um, I remember watching an oral history from somebody who was on the kinder transport and he hadn't been with his parents for seven years and they survived, they survived camps and he was reunited with them in Paris, but he was 15 when he was reunited with them and his mother remembers a child of eight. And he said, you know, my mother still thought of me as a child of eight. She couldn't, con it was hard for her to understand that I was not eight anymore. I was 15 and I was so, I really, what more could I have asked for? My parents survived. I had a, li a, a life during the war that was okay. And, but he broke down when he was saying it because the confusion and the, the situations that children go through, I, I think they're so dismissed so easily. Yeah. And that's what used to, used to happen a lot. But now there's more of an understanding because, you know, but... Um, well, it took a long time for there to be an understanding and only and when children, one, survivors it came my, together. It took into my adulthood and I'm 84. Yes, I mean, I, I remember in 1991 when they had the first child survivors conference and somehow this was a safe space for children to talk about their experiences. So when was the one in Prague that you and I were both at, but we probably didn't meet? Like 1994, I think, or 1995. And that was the first time that the museum, just for people's interest, were sending people out like Sudi to ask people if they were ready and willing and able, that there was a safe repository for anything that they had that would document that these things had happened. Right. And so for me, I have three children and we talk about, I have these, these various things which have been, you know, they're in a drawer and people look at them from time to time. But we decided that in order for them to have life and meaning after I die, rather than one child or another look after them and pass them on to a grandchild, that they would go to the, the, the Holocaust Museum where they would be accessible to my family. They'll have the, the links and can look at them. But where well, also, we need to know information about them. Not everything is self-explanatory. And, and, but, but they, will be, they will be preserved and will have a life of their own and an importance um, yes. to the larger world. And that's a very important reason to have them go to a safe place like the, the museum. Um, last question, I promise. Um, okay. I saw that you took part in the Winston, um, the train project, the inspiration for goodness. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about like what that was like? I, that like really fascinates me. How much time do you have? <laughs> um, okay. Tell me it all. Quickly. No, no. Um, so in, I don't know if everybody knows about it, but in, in 20, what was it? Nine, 2009. 2009? 19. Nine, 2009. A group of people in the Czech Republic I should I should say that Nicholas Winton is a national figure in the Czech Republic. You can talk to anybody on the street and they all know about Nicholas Winton. It's a small country. And he saved basically a whole generation of Jews, right? He saved 700 and there were none left. So, But he's absolutely a, a, a well-known figure. And um, there's, a, there's a very interesting backstory, which only special people like you will hear. Um, there was a, um, a person whose who's, um, son, a, an adult man whose son was a, a doctor and there was a sick child. He saved the child. Um, this, this guy was the head of the Czech railways and he learned 
that the doctor who had saved his grandchild's life had been a kinder transport child off right and he was so overwhelmed as he wanted to do something major and he initiated that whole idea of honoring nicholas winton by having this this train which was called the train for inspiration or inspiration for goodness inspiration for goodness which would promote um the idea that people you know people could do good acts like this and that's really how that started and so they he they lost a lot of money it was a it was it was wonderful so i'll go on the on the being on it so they reached out to as many of the of us can uh, winton children as we're called they could find and in the end 22 of us or was it 22 or something like that 20 of us um got to go my sister was there my nephew and so on and it started out it was of course having a steam train going across europe at, at, in 2009 meant that it was of great interest not just to people interested in the holocaust who knew nothing about actually train buffs people who are interested in trains so it, it it developed a life of its own and we all boarded in prague and then we crossed the country um and there was a jazz jazz band on board there was a wonderful restaurant um we had talks between us and there were a couple of interesting things personally um I had the experience at first I didn't want to go because I thought it was going to be kind of a, a Disney. Oh, you know, these kids are traveling across and I would no interest in that, but then it turned out it was not going to be that. So I said, I would go. It was really was, it had young people had, had um, gone, got competitions for art and for music and for poetry. And when they won, they won places on the train. So it was a, a mix of the, the, us, survivors and these young people who had wanted to go and written why they wanted to go. Um, so there were two things. One is I realized how traumatic that must have been to be a three-year-old on a train which was probably 48 hours long, no getting off, no um, no restaurant car, you know, no nothing you were locked in the locked in in your cabin and it made me think about what must have been packed in my rucksack which Susie has there must have been food and toys and things like that it must have been very difficult for little kids the nine and ten year olds kind of enjoyed it it was an adventure but it was a long journey and so doing it at my age I realized how really difficult that must have been the special thing that happened to me on that train is that I got to meet two or three people who there was a Czech school in, in England, there was a Czech school um, started during the war for sort of um, like an inter, not an international school, but it was a boarding school. So kids could go and have a Czech curriculum so they could, you know, so if my sister went to that, she was older. My mother wouldn't let me go and I was too young anyway. But on the train, I met friends of my sisters from the school and one of them said, I remember you on the train and she described to me how um, all, all of the older girls wanted to mother the little ones, right, you know, and play with them. And apparently I would have none of that. I was very stoic. I never cried, but I would not allow anybody like to play with me or sit on anybody's lap. I just sat stone faced. I was, I was a very, um, um, unsatisfactory companion <laughs> but it was so interesting to meet someone who knew me at that remembered time. yeah it was wow. that was uh, that was really really meaningful to me and what she about your sister? you and you didn't even remember you exactly what did your sister say about that time my sister had a good time with the boys <laughs> <laughs> you know nine and ten and so on um it was a different experience if you're a little bit older. Mm -hmm. You know, three, two, three, four is was different, but I did get looked after. But anyway, but it was so interesting. So it was a wonderful that train trip was amazing. The other thing that happened 
Um, so there's this steam train, which, and they had to stop all the trains across Europe to let this train go by. I mean, it was an enormous undertaking. And there wasn't water, you know, everywhere. So people would run across the fields with hoses to fill up the thing. And we would stop us. We stopped every night. That was the other thing. I, I Back to my story about recognizing how different that journey was to when you just stayed holed up in the in the cabin, right? Um, the, the, whatever you call them, the, in the train. We got off every night and were very much welcomed by the community where we got off the train. And when the train stopped for, re, for rewatering, you can't say it's refueling, people would be on the platform and this will probably make me cry. Sometimes the mayor would come and apologize. Oh God. Very but it much. also shows you that there's, you no, know, there were such, I mean, there must've been amazing people as you went along in such a dismal circumstance. Oh yeah. So they there were people up. at all the stations that we stopped, they would come and greet us. And it was very meaningful. Wow, come, that's really... And then when we got to the end, my sister and I, who both of us tend to be organizers, I, in my later life, I was a school principal. So we, you know, we got to be, I got to be mm -hmm. knowing how to do stuff with people and my sister's an organizer. So we helped some of the stuff that was going on on the train with, we knew Olga who started it, who was working there. So she said, when we get to London, there's going to be a, a big phalanx of photographers. This was very well... You know, it was very public and very well documented in, in England. We got on, we got on the ferry, and there was big stuff in Holland. And she said, "You will you go off quietly before we all troop off and tell Nicky we've arrived because we knew he was going to be at the on station on the platform, but we didn't want him to be sitting there alone." So I crept off and went ahead of the group, and I said, "Nicky." It, you know, it's ever the trains arrive. There are going to be a lot of people in a few minutes. He looked at him and he said, thank heavens, I just don't have to find you all homes to stay tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great sense of humor. It's a good yeah. sense of humor. Yeah. Um, thank you. That project has always interested me and I've never met anyone that was on it. So thank you. That was great. It was great. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Bye. Thank you both. Thank you, Josh. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Pharrell um, has any questions, um, but I think I'm gonna wrap it up here. Thank you so much, this meant so much to me and I think it was really successful, so. That was, it was, did you say it was stressful? No, successful. Oh, good, I hope you got what you wanted. That it you... was better than what I expected. Be good. So, good. thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, no, you're great, I'm impressed. I have to say your timeline was a little short, Josh. Let's try and do this a few days earlier. <laughs> I can they, tease. All right. They like um, wanted us to do. You they like tried off. to. Oh, they like tried to coordinate all of these programs onto Yom Hashoah, and um, I was like under the impression that like these programs were going to like take place over the course of like you know April May, but right. they're all targeting for Yom Hashoah, which makes sense. Right. So I'm like trying to coordinate a couple of things. So a little overwhelming, but. Well, you know what I mean. It wasn't maybe as perfect, but I mean, I don't know. You, I think you did a great job. I think so too. And I think yeah. you did. I, I've got to figure out how, to, how you do that slide thing because I'm giving a, a talk. Uh, I belong to a community called Kahal Bara, Community of Choice. Mm -hmm. Probably the most unkosher Jewish group you could meet. Try this, Secular Humanistic Judaism. I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, okay? Mm -hmm. But that's my, that's my group. And I'm doing the Yom HaShoah service. Um, on the 3rd of May, that's when we're, we're doing one. And we're just struggling with how to put my, some of my pictures up on this, as you did. Right, so. Um, you can send me. I struggle with it as well. And, um, and my son came in and gave me a short tutorial before. Oh, send him to me. <laughs> well, um, do you need the pictures that I used? Well, I have them, but okay, good. But I, but I love. I always love to see somebody else's. Um, you know, you can use there. We have many resources that you can use. So, yeah. um, you could pull them up on the internet. 
when you share, you just simply go to the top of the screen or the bottom of the screen. There's a green button that says share. Do you see it? Um, I see recording. There's a green button. Our client connection is encrypted. Um, so do you know where you go to the um, bar? Mute, unmute, stop video. Yes. So if you go, there's a, there's a green button that's a share. Oh, share screen, yes. That's right. If you open share, then you can, um, when you open share, whatever you have open on your desktop, you just click on it twice and that allows you to share. Okay. okay. It's fool around with it a little before you do your presentation. Yeah. Well, thank you all very much. Um, thank it was you. a pleasure to see everybody and a great pleasure to meet you, Susie. It was really wonderful meeting you in person, kind of. <laughs> thank you, Josh, Max, or Al. Thank you. Thanks. So shall I just leave the meeting or are you going to add terminate us? Oh, I'm ending the call right now. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye.